Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Stevenson, and I'm your host for today's episode of Someone You Should Know. Today, we're going to visiting with Mary Ford, a retired journalist and new author. Mary lives in Situate with her husband, Conley, and her dog, George. She's the former editor of the Hingham Journal and the Cohasset Mariner for 28 years. And today, you're going to find out that Mary has lived quite a life. Welcome, Mary Ford. Well, Scott, thank you so much for having me and for giving me the opportunity to visit with you today and share my story, but also to say hello to all the wonderful people of Hingham that I miss dearly. And I, I was so honored and proud to be able to be the editor of your venerable local community newspaper for such a long period of time. It was one of the great joys of my life. Well, Mary, let me ask you this. Where did you grow up? I actually am a situate girl. Now, I know when I first took over the Hingham Journal, some people had trouble with that, and I had to educate them that I was spending more time in Hingham than I was <laughs> actually in situate. But I, was, uh, I moved to situate just before the first grade, and I went through all 12 years at situate public schools, graduating from situate high school with a great and wonderful class of 1966. And I wanna say hello to any Hingamites out there who might be situate 66 grads. And it, there was a great bond, as you can imagine, with um, kids that grew up from first grade through 12th. And um, so we remember each other dearly to this day. So my parents moved to town in about 1954, I think, and um, that's where we stayed. Tell me about your mom and dad. Well, my mom, which was very typical in those days, was a stay-at-home mom. And she was the most wonderful person. We lost her in 2011. And she was uh, one of my best friends, as well as my mother. And my dad had a lot of different jobs. Um, he was a salesman for many years, but more recently, I mean, he passed away in 1991, but the final years of his life, he worked in Hingham. He was the um, the head and the, the, the spirit and the um, wonderful vision behind the Pilgrim Skating Arena, where cool. he coached and ran all kinds of wonderful skating programs for the community. He was known as Mr. Taylor, so my maiden name is Taylor, and I know many Hingham people would remember him. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I do. I have two brothers and two sisters. I'm so fortunate. The five of us were always very close growing up. My mother had one late baby, my sister Holly, which today she would actually, my mom I think was 38 when she had Holly, which today is now almost young to have a child. But back then it was quite old. So I'm actually 15 years older than Holly and my sister Lisa is just 13 months older than I am. And we have two brothers in between, but, but Holly's so funny because she's actually a golf pro and lives in Florida and she's head of the the PGA in Port St. Lucie, but she had completely different parents than the rest of us, as you can imagine. I wonder who were those people that raised Holly with such freedom and openness and the rest of us? We, we had a completely different experience, but very fortunate we're all very close to this day. And what was your experience like in high school? Well, I was actually, and people would be surprised to hear this perhaps because I wasn't particularly shy as a reporter or a journalist, but I was a very shy girl. Um, I always followed my sister Lisa around. And um, so it, I was quiet. In fact, I was so quiet that I wasn't even voted the quietest, which is kind of funny. But, um, but anyway, I so high school, I discovered the Beatles. And I was what back in the day, it was called the Beatle maniac. And it was a great outlet for me. And I, I started my writing career probably back then, when I was able to get pen pals, I had a pen pal in up in Newcastle in England, and another pen pal in Germany, who were both Beatle maniacs as well. And I started writing to them. And we wrote back and forth on those wonderful blue fold out aerograms, if people would remember them, they were quite inexpensive. And, and so I followed them and then I started writing to all kinds of people um, related to the Beatles. I, I sent Brian Epstein a Christmas card and he wrote me back and thanked me. I wrote Ted Kennedy a letter. Um, he was our Senator back then, a new, newly elected Senator, I might say, because it was a, a story in the Boston Globe that the British invasion was gonna be halted. It was as if we were back in the revolution and they were gonna stop these British groups from coming across. So I wrote to him 
And he actually wrote me twice, once saying he was looking into it. And next, he, he wrote to reassure me that wasn't going to happen and sent me a the copy of whatever they were talking about, whether it was a proposed law or some kind of visa thing in triplicate. So um, I have a huge scrapbook, thanks to my sister, Lisa, who saved everything for me because I'm not that organized when it comes to that. And, and so I, it was just a wonderful experience. And I saw them three times. I saw them in Boston Garden and I saw them at um, Shea Stadium in 1965 and then at uh, Suffolk Downs in 1966. So it was fun. It was a big part of my life. Now here's a photograph of you and some other girl um, holding a Beatles banner. And that banner Wait. seems to be the same banner that's in the picture on the front page of the Boston Globe. Do you have a story a, for actually, that? I think, I think it was a Boston Herald Traveler. Oh, I, okay. And sure. No, it is a story. So that's my cousin Evelyn. And my sister Lisa, I think, is taking the picture with her brownie camera. So we got outside the Madison Hotel, outside Boston Garden in September 1964. We were the first ones there. So you can see us holding that banner. And during the course of the day, all kinds of people were leaning out the windows of the hotel, shaking Beatles wigs and things like that. We didn't know if it was the real thing. So as, as the day moved on, um, of course, hundreds of thousands of uh, Beatle maniacs arrived. So we ended up sort of on the front page. You can barely see us. You can see that we're in the middle of a crowd, but it was great fun. Now, Mary, my memory is that it was harder than heck to get a ticket to see the Beatles. And if you did get in, you couldn't hear them because all the girls were screaming. It How did was you get a ticket? Oh, it was very difficult because they announced them and they sold out within hours and I did not get a ticket. And I almost had a nervous breakdown. So my mother was really worried about me. And my uncle Brad, who's Evelyn's dad, who's in the picture, was, was able to to get a, um, a ticket. I don't, can't remember how he did, but he managed to. In the interim, my sister Lisa sent Dave Maynard on WBZ. They were having a contest. She sent about 50 postcards in and she won a ticket. And then on the day of, my dad drove us in. He went to a, he found a scalper and got Evelyn a ticket. So the three of us all went. But the funny story is when we got inside, I noticed that I was way up in the nosebleed section and I saw my sister Lisa with her ticket from WBZ. She was in the sixth row. Ooh. I went down and I begged her to change places and she did. And we've been, we were friends before that, but it was such a wonderful thing for her to do. And so I was very close and I was able to rush the stage with a bunch of other girls and be thrown back by state troopers. <laughs> it was great fun. I still have all kinds of records and, and um, I have, uh, I, you're probably going to ask me about John Lennon's button. I have a button from John Lennon. And uh, so I have a lot of stuff from the Beatles days. Now, how did you get John Lennon's button? Well, as, as I was saying, I wrote to everyone and I was pretty persistent. And so I wrote to his aunt Mimi who raised him. And we all knew the story of, of the Fab Four. So I must have just sent it to Liverpool and it got to her. So lo and behold, she wrote me back and she, I just asked her for something that John Lennon had touched. And so she sent me his button with a little note and I have it in a little frame that says August 1964 with her note. And it looks like it's a button from probably a school uniform. It's gray with a bunch of little threads sticking out. But I was so excited when I opened it up. My mother didn't know what had happened. I was screaming in the front yard of our house on Gannett Road in North Situate. And um, I've had it ever since. And it's probably worth a small fortune. I'm wondering when, it, when the Antique Roadshow comes to town, that's I'm <laughs> headed there with that button, my little, uh, my little story behind it. Did you go to college after you graduated from Situate High School? I did. I did not know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. Um, I was a pretty smart kid in high school. I was called a brain, but I wasn't in the top, top group. I was sort of in the second echelon. So I didn't have any trouble getting into the University of Miami. It was the only place I applied to because my sister Lisa, who always knew what she wanted to do, um, she wanted to get into mass communications, which is kind of ironic because I'm the one that ended up there. Um, and so I followed her down to the University of Miami and it was a great experience. I could break out of my situate roots and um, the weather was great. And we used to sit on top of the on top of Mahoney Hall, which was our dormitory, with our, um, our Monopoly boards covered with 
with tin with uh, tin foil and uh, baby oil on our faces so we could be tanned for Christmas break. And that was huge back then. I know all the dermatologists out there are not happy. Believe me, I learned my lesson, but way too late. And I hear that you were somehow involved with the Miami baseball team. Well, yes, I was, I was always a sports fan. Um, so um, the interesting thing was when I was at Miami, my freshman year, I helped tutor some of the freshman football players, which was great fun. And the, the Miami Hurricanes were huge back then. I mean, they were always number one or two in the country and going to the Orange Bowl and, and seeing them play with all the, the spirit and the pep rallies was wonderful. But I wasn't really coordinated to be a, a cheerleader. They, they were actually got scholarships and did flips and all kinds of things. So the baseball team was also a phenomenal team. It was division one, but didn't have much many fans. So the coach um, whose name was Ron Frazier came up with an idea of having bat girls. And the job of the bat girl was basically to chase some foul balls and to hand the bats, kind of keep things in order and to be friendly to the people in the stands. So I tried out and I was on the original bat girl squad. And now I see a group here and, and uh, which number are you? Well, I don't, I can't, um, I think I'm second from the left there. Number seven. I, number seven, yes. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. We traveled with these guys and, and, and they were phenomenal athletes. So it, it was one of my fondest college memories being there. Now, I understand that Miami's a big party school, but I assume you had to study at some time. What did you I was always end a up good graduating? Well, I was always a good student. Um, when I grew up, you did your homework, whether you wanted to or not. I mean, I can remember the fear of not doing homework uh, just by my parents, especially my dad, was, was not worth it. So I always did my work. And so I did that. And I had no trouble graduating. And, what did uh, you major in? I majored in English. So it, it was um, a good thing. It held me in good stead as I went forward. Now, and after you got out of college, what, what year would that have been? It would have been 1970, I believe. 1970. Um, and after that, what did you do with your life? Well, I went back to Situate. And in those days, and which I think a lot of um, listeners may uh, and viewers may relate to, you just didn't go back home to live. It, it just wasn't really done. So when my sister and I came back home, I, my sister Holly had our bedroom. So Holly had a little small room, and so she moved into the bigger room with the double bed, with the twin beds. And so that was kind of a, a, a thing that my mother was saying, you know, we love you, you're great, you've graduated, now it's time to move on. So initially, I wanted to be what, what was called back in the day a stewardess. And at Miami, there were tons of stewardesses that came in and out, and it looked like such a fun thing to do to get all the travel, and they wore fabulous uniforms, and you had to be a certain size and weight and it was it was a, a kind of a cool thing but i tried out i went to american a bunch of times and and they didn't seem to be hiring or i wasn't the right fit so i noticed um in the boston globe there was an advertisement for teachers at La, in los angeles the los angeles city school district and i thought well i've been to miami los angeles sounds like it's going to be a wonderful uh, place to be so um i applied i went down for an interview and had no trouble getting hired. And I didn't find out until much later when I was teaching out there that the reason that LA City Schools was looking out of state for teachers was that California had a, had a rule or a law that you had to have a five-year degree, not a master's, but a five-year degree to teach. And so they were hiring four-year degree teachers because they were cheaper. So off I went. I remember my salary was $7,500 a year. <laughs> I only taught one year, but um, I had it split over 10 months, I think. So I, I packed up my, I, I worked at a, a restaurant in Situate Harbor that summer and uh, late spring called the Bellboy, which no longer exists, but it you got really great tips. And I saved up enough for a down payment on my Volkswagen, which was bright orange. It was a Volkswagen Beetle. My mother helped me pack it up, put a sign on the back and said, California, here she comes. And my brother Harvey helped me drive across country. And then I was off. <laughs> wow. And then didn't, when you got to California, did you teach? I did. I taught at Gompers Junior High School. And I lived in a, um, an apartment complex in Torrance called um, the South Bay Club. And what I thought at the time was I had researched again, we didn't have internet. 
So I had written for a copy of the um, LA Times and looked at advertisements that it was for singles only. And I, oh, this is gonna be just like college. It's gonna be people that are just fresh out of college and unmarried and it's gonna be fun. Well, it turns out single in California just means you're not married. So there were tons of of men there, especially who'd been married several times (laughs) that were a lot older. And so it was kind of interesting, but that's where I met my husband Conley. He had been transferred out from his job with Western Electric from Alabama, where he was living at the time, to Los Angeles. So we met in that apartment complex and started dating from there. And how long did you date before you got married? We didn't date all that long. I think it was seven or eight months. And we got married in August of 72. And um, and then that was it. We've been married for 48 years. Now, whose we, idea was it to get married, yours or his? I think it was mutual. I, it was a pretty mutual idea. Um, so it was time. He was actually 30. So he's seven years older than I am. So it was, and, and when we went for our marriage license, uh, they asked him what marriage it was for him. And they asked me for an ID. So <laughs> back then, if you were 30 and unmarried, it, it was kind of unusual. You were old. So did anything interesting happen when your your new married life in California? It did. Well, our claim to fame, our 15 minutes, which turned into be like two hours, actually, um, we got a a postcard in the mail in our apartment um, suggesting that we try out for the newlywed game. And it was something that the newlywed game producer sent out to all the people that were in the marriage roles, newly married people in Los Angeles. So we thought, oh, this this would be a lot of fun. So we did. We we, um, went down and we tried out. And there were about 60 couples that night trying out. And the way they did it was they put you in um, groups of four and put you on a mock game. So you went on a stage and there were lights and there were four or five producers sitting in front in like the front row. And they had they did not smile, laugh or, or act in any way like they were interested. So we we left feeling that, oh, this we're sure we're not going to be selected. The only hint we had was we were taken into a separate room from the other three couples that we were on the mock game with. And about a week later, lo and behold, we got a call uh, from one of their assistant producers saying, congratulations, you've been picked to be on the newlywed game. So we went down and um, we were on the game. And in those days, um, a lot of people still had black and white TVs. So we were given very strict rules on what we what we could wear. You couldn't wear a plaid or anything flowery. So I just wore, a, I think, a navy blue turtleneck. And um, so we were pretty careful. And it was interesting too, because it wasn't that long after, I think in 1964 was the big um, cheating scandal. I think it was the $64,000 question. So they had security guards that stood, you can't see them on camera, but they stand right in front of you while you're answering the questions to make sure you're not slipping notes or giving any kind of a signal. So um, it was kind of interesting. So, so we were on the show and I think Conley enjoyed it more than I did because he's, he's a ham and Bob Eubank seemed to really connect with him. But we didn't get any questions right, not even the bonus. So we were totally incompatible. Um, so much so that um, probably a month or so later, we got another call asking us to be on the game again for what they called the alumni game. And what they did was they invited back the least compatible couples who were who were kind of um, you know, somehow engaging. Obviously, if you were kind of a dud, they didn't want to have you on again, or the more popular couples. So we were asked back. And um, we now, were because there. you didn't get anything right on the first game, did you and Conley try to figure out how to make sure you got a good score? We Well, we talked on the way down the second time and just threw questions back and forth that might come up. So one of our questions was something like, I said to him, well, if you could be anybody, who would you be? And he said, I'd be the president. And at the time, Nixon was president. And so when we got into the game, one of, one of the questions, surprisingly, was very similar. I think it was, if your husband could be someone for 24 hours, who would he be? And I thought, oh my God, we're gonna win. We're gonna get a question right. <laughs> and so I immediately put down Nixon, but, and they, they swing you out on these little sort of um, movable uh, prom, uh, seats that come out. So you go out and then you go back and the guys come out and then you're out together. 
So um, they asked when it got to be Conley's turn, he was trying to think of the star of Kung Fu, which was his favorite show. And the guy's name was John Carradine. And so he kept saying to Bob Eubanks, I just can't think of that guy's name. And, you know, he's on like Monday nights. And Bob Eubanks kept saying, Conley, would you hurry up? And he dragged and Conley dragged it out to the point where they were going to take action. And then he just said, to hell with it, I'll say Nixon. And everyone in the audience went crazy. And Bob Eubanks just dropped his head and said, some people just live right. Conley. <laughs> Lo and behold, Conley staged that whole thing. <laughs> So we got one question right, which was well, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> now, I understand that you lived uh, in a number of different places uh, because Conley had a job that transferred him around the world. He did. He was with a company called Western Electric, which was part of AT&T. And um, those, re those the viewers that are, are our generation are gonna remember AT&T, Ma Bell was a humongous monopoly at the time, but very well regulated. And so his small division of Western Electric was called Purchase Products Inspection. So after we were married a year in California, we had the wonderful opportunity to go to Yokohama, Japan, where he was going to be assigned to the Trans-Pacific Cable Project. And they were still, they were manufacturing cable that would go on the bottom of the ocean for telephone calls. And there, it was a very complicated process. The cables were huge, as you can imagine. And they had all kinds of repeaters. And I think for a long time, I could tell when I talked to someone overseas, whether they were on a cable or a satellite because of an echo kind of thing, because a repeater repeats the message throughout. So we had a wonderful experience in Japan. I was initially a little bit in culture shock when I got there, um, but so I got a job teaching English as a second language um, at Greg International School, and it turned out to be a great experience because I, I connected with, um, with the Japanese people, which was a little more difficult to do uh, because they are very, they're kind of very shy and standoffish, and, and they don't want you to really speak Japanese with them. They laugh and kind of run and find someone that, that speaks English. So it was a nice way for me to really connect. And I was invited to some homes and invited them over. And it was great fun. And how long did you stay in Japan? We were there about two, two and a half years. And directly from there, we were transferred to Calais, France for the Trans-Pacific Cable Project. And again, that was a super experience. Now I had studied French in high school and I believe I took one semester in college, but always struggled with the speaking part of it. So I thought, oh, this is going to be a great opportunity. So shortly after we arrived there, I put a little ad in the paper and I, I found a tutor to help me work on my French. And she became a great friend and she worked with me. We were there for two and a half years. But even after that amount of time, I was still struggling. If, if the French people speak really fast, um, but I could I could carry some conversation and get around. But but if someone got into a really deep or there were a lot of women having coffee together and everybody was was talking at the same time, it was impossible. But again, it was just it was a lot of fun. Now, and what year are we in now when you're in France? It was uh, 1975 ish, 76. Okay. Um, we were transferred then back to the States and we were went to St. Joe, Missouri which a lot of people, if you haven't been to, it's an old Western town. What I learned from St. Joe was that's where the West was won. The Midwest was actually the West when, uh, when we were developing as a country. And St. Joe is noted for a couple of things. It's where the Pony Express started and that only lasted a couple of years. Um, it's where Jesse James was assassinated and it's where Walter Cronkite grew up and his dad was a dentist. So. Uh, there were all kinds of little museums and statues and things like that in, in St. Joe. And the interesting little side to that is that it, um, St. Joe was really on the map because it would, um, when the wagon trains went through, uh, they would put them on barges and take them across the river, the Missouri River actually to Kansas. So what happened when plans were put, were floated to build a bridge, St. Joe said, no way. Do we want a bridge built? Because we're, we've got this great industry going. So guess what? The bridge was built in Kansas City and the rest is history. St. Joe pretty much died and Kansas City grew to be a big metropolis. Now, how long were you in Missouri? 
we were there about 18 months and it's where our first son was born. And then what's um, his name? His name is Jarrett. Okay. Very proud of him. Um, he's an army veteran as is my other son, James. So we were then transferred to Minneapolis and we lived in a town called New Hope. And um, there I did some substitute teaching and I taught English as a second language at Hennepin Technical College, um, which, is, um, which was fun. And I met people from all over the world, including a lot of um, Vietnamese soon to be Americans who were part of the uh, refugees that, that left when, we, um, when the Vietnam War ended. And then our second son, James was born there in, in Minneapolis. And what was your next stop on this road around no, it's, the world? It, it's, yeah. So from there, we went over to Southampton, England to be on the, the, the next transatlantic cable project. And that was great fun. My sister Lisa by this time had married an Englishman and was living in London. So the timing was perfect. And we lived in a little village called Sway, which is in the new forest, which there's nothing new about it because it was actually uh, founded or, or discovered by William the Conqueror. But the, the New Forest has, has a particular type of pony called the New Forest Ponies, and they roam wild, and they are just wonderful animals, and they're all over the place. They walk in the villages, and, and um, it, it just was a great experience. And I had my boys right in the um, they both went to the Robin Nursery School. And, and just as a little funny aside, and my son James hopefully won't see this because he'd be embarrassed, but the English are so different in the way they raised their kids. Um, and so um, when James was in the Robin Nursery, he was little, he had to go, he had to be potty trained to go. So we had been there a while. He was only 18 months when we got there, but when he was two and a half, I put him in. So lo and behold, he wet his pants and he came home in a pair of purple bloomers. And that was the last time he ever wet his pants. <laughs> Mrs. Dijon, the head of the school, if you wet your pants, you had to wear, if you were a boy, you had to wear those pur purple bloomers and you wore them home. <laughs> it sounds awful. She, she would be held up for child abuse today. But it was- it Mary, was, I think it's child abuse for you to tell that story. Probably and, uh, this is. This is going to be on YouTube. And <laughs> <laughs> now, was that your sure. first time to London? No, um, it wasn't actually, or to England. It was back, we ratchet back to our, my college days with my sister Lisa, and we both worked at Johnson's a w in Marshfield, which some of the viewers may remember. It was a wonderful place. Mr. Johnson taught math at Situate High School, and he lived in Situate. And, um, but he, he opened this, um, this a and root beer stand, um, I think in the early 60s, it's kind of a second thing. It was probably a retirement thing that he was looking forward to. So you made great tips, so we're car, we were car hops. And um, so we saved our tips and we decided that we wanted to try to go to England for, this, for the next summer. And we, we didn't come from means, we didn't have a lot of money. So we um, saved our tips, but we knew we had to have a job in order to do that. So again, we wrote and we called and we did all kinds of research and we found out from the, from the consulate that really the only way you could get a work permit in England was to either work for an American company with a branch over there or for an English company with a branch in America. Well, that's all we needed to know. We called Raleigh Bicycles up in Massachusetts. Turned out the HR manager there, his best friend, was the HR manager in Nottingham, England at the Raleigh Bicycle Factory. So we got our work permits and off we went and uh, we stayed in London for a couple of days and made our way to Nottingham. And we worked and we just had the, the most fabulous experience um, that anybody could have. It was a blast. Now, when did your England experience as a family end? It ended um, 19, the very end of 1982, early 83. And we were actually transferred back to our house in Minneapolis, which we'd rented out in a town called New Hope. And we were there about a year before my husband was, but what Western Electric then went through and AT&T went through at this time was divestiture where the, governor, the government split the company up into all these millions of pieces. So he went with Ameritech, which was no law, I don't think it's in existence any longer. It was one of the temporary baby bells, I think they were called. And we were transferred to Chicago. And um, then we lived in uh, a town called Lake Zurich in the Northwest suburbs. Now, when you were living in the Chicago suburbs, uh, what did you do now? 
Well, this is where it really all began. I had started, I had been substitute teaching in Minneapolis and um, the different places that we lived, but um, frankly, substitute teaching for me anyway, at the secondary level was always a challenge. Um, it seemed like the kids were there to figure out how they could ruin your day. And they <laughs> all did. So um, I had this experience at Barrington High School and Barrington High School is a fabulous high school. It's where the Chicago Bears did their, um, their training. I mean, it had elevators and unbelievable sports schools, very affluent, and, but it didn't mean it was any easier. So I, um, I was substituting one day and lo and behold, I'm in homeroom and these four boys, they were seniors, stood up in the front of the room, turned their backs to me, lowered their pants and mooned me. <laughs> so <laughs> I was not happy as you can imagine and the class was all rolling on the floor thinking this was the funniest thing. So they had phones in the room and, and the principals were called deans. So I called up and I explained what had happened and they apologized that I was having a bad day. And I was, that really bothered me. And I said, well, yeah, but I really think these four boys are having the bad day. I, I think something should happen and nothing happened. One of them came back at the end of school and apologized and that was it. So I decided I'd had enough. And my neighbor in Lake Zurich had this little job with the Daily Herald with what they called their around town column. The Daily Herald is very much like the Patriot Ledger. It had a lot of different editions. And each town back in those days had, an, had a neighbor section. So she was the around town writer for the neighbor section on Lake Zurich. And I thought, oh boy, that sounds like such a fun, great job. I'd love to do something like that. So I looked in the paper and they were advertising for correspondence. So I thought, okay, I'll go check this out and see what it's like. So I went down to Arlington Heights and I went in to my first newsroom. And as I've told many of my friends, I immediately felt like I was home. And part of the reason was that newsrooms are notoriously disorganized and messy with papers from <laughs> floor to ceiling, dust everywhere. And um, I'd always been challenged in terms of being the, the Mrs. Housekeeper. So I felt very comfortable and all of that kind of wonderful organized chaos. And so it, there was a wonderful uh, city editor there who, um, and there were a lot of people that tried out, I think there were like 50 of us, who gave us a little work, a little uh, speech on what our job was and how to structure a story. And then we were all given assignments and I had to go do a, um, I cover a meeting in Wakanda, a little town where they went into executive sessions. So I was there until the wee hours of the morning and they bought a fire truck. So I wrote a story and at buying a fire truck was a big deal. And they put it on the front page uh, of our edition of the paper, except the copy desk had changed my name to Betty Ford. <laughs> First experience getting my name published in a newspaper article was Betty Ford. Now, Betty Ford was no longer the first lady, but, but her, her uh, rehabilitation clinic was very famous. So they got, the, copy has, the copy desk guy just told me he just saw Ford and thought Betty, he just couldn't help himself. So. But I caught on and I learned, um, I worked for the Daily Herald for about two and a half years as a correspondent. And they gave me everything. Once the, I, I learned as my career progressed that if you're dependable and you can do this, people are gonna use you. And so I did feature stories, I covered news, and I was a runner at the time. I had run the Minneapolis Marathon, the Twin Cities, and I ran, I ran the Chicago Marathon while I was there. And so they gave me a running column, which was great fun to do. And I made it a point um, to always interview the person when I went to cover a race, to, they came in last, because they're the ones that really had the story to tell. And I remember one time they couldn't find the woman and they had the police looking and she'd gone and had coffee at someone's house. So it was really funny, but she was a grandmother and a 10 K to her took like three hours. So we finally found her and I got, I got a good story out of it. Well, what's the next stop on your merry-go-round of life? For, so with Conley's job, he realized that things with West, with Ameritech were changing and he was transferred to Lucent Technologies, which was in Massachusetts, which was a great opportunity for us to come back to the East Coast. So um, lo and behold, we came and he decided, let's look in situ at, because it was very close to my mom. And um, he said, if, if we live in North Andover, where he was going to be working, um, that, that I would be driving to situ at all the time. So he chose to do the commute. And um, we moved to situ just a mile away from back my home. Apartment. 
back home. And the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call the Mariner newspapers because I loved my job so much. I had found my, my calling. And I talked to a man who said, um, Judy Enright, she's always looking for people. And so then I called Judy, who was the editor of the Norwell and then the Norwell and the Hanover Mariners. And she started to give me all kinds of work. So it was, it was, it was great. I was so happy for that. So you were a reporter for the Norwell and Hanover Mar Mariners? I was. I was you a, to, so you had to learn new towns? I had to learn new towns. I was for about a total for about four years. Um, I did a lot of you know, writing and reporting, uh, reporting and feature stories and, and subbing for Judy when she was on vacation to try to figure out how to put the paper together. And um, you know, it was funny, the Natural Science Center used to send us all kinds of press releases. And the first time I had to fill in for her when she was on vacation, I think we put five pages in of Natural Science Center information. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, we have enough. <laughs> stuff for this. So we had a lot of fun. It was it was great. We were great times back then. Great talented people that I met in the in the newspaper industry. It's, it attracts very, very talented people, whether photographers, writers, graphic artists. It was great. So after that, um, they had an opening in the Cohasset Mariner and the Hingham Mariner. So what a lot of Hingham people may not remember is that the Mariner and the Hingham Journal coexisted for 13 years. Oh, they were two different papers. They were two different papers. So when um, when Frank McLean, whose family had had the journal for many years, sold the paper, David Cutler, who was the man that owned the Mariner group, tried to buy it, but he sold it to Henry Bosworth, who owned the Quincy Sun. So David Cutler started the Hingham Mariner in 1980. So in 19... Um, 91, I think it was, or 92, I was the Hingham Mariner editor and the journal and the, you know, and the Mariner had competed for those 13 years. And then after 18 months, the journal, Henry Bosworth sold the journal to um, Cap City's ABC, which is the company that owned the Mariner at that time. And David was still the publisher. And so the two papers were combined and I moved into the Hingham office. At that time. As the editor? As the editor, yes. And it, what year was that that you became editor of the Hingham Journal? So it would have been 93, I became editor of the Hingham Journal, but I had been editor of the Hingham Mariner for about 18 months before then. And I, it, while I was with Cohasset all that time, but the Cohasset Mariner stayed itself. So you were editing both papers? Both papers. If someone had ever really sat down and said, Mary, you're going to be putting out 104 papers a year, I probably would have run down the street screaming and pulling my hair out. But I've been a very much a day-to-day -day person my whole life. And, and I learned just to be week to week. And, um, but it, it was a marvelous career and it changed. Um, you know, in the old days when we first started, of course, there was no internet. We wrote all the obituaries and um, we accepted press releases and things like that. But but most of the stuff was generated by us. It, it, there was kind of a, a wall there. And then as time moved on and staffing became more challenged and the internet uh, grew and became more of a factor, um, one of the things I think I did really well was welcome the community into the papers to be contributors. And I was very fortunate that Hingham and Cohasset had really, uh, for the most part, a very well-educated uh, readership and people that really cared about their town and they loved having the paper as a way that they could communicate and exchange ideas and opinions and and celebrate and to do so many different things and I found that the more I opened it up the more stuff I got and I was just processing unbelievable I mean from photos to spreads to human interest stories, and we, we kept the news and any kind of editorial that, that I would write. So I was careful that we didn't cross over too many journalistic lines, but it, but it was a great way to give people ownership into, into a wonderful institution, which was uh, the Hingham Journal and also the, the Cohasset Mariner. Now, did you found the Citizen of the Year concept? No, that was from Henry Bosworth. He had brought that up from the Quincy Sun, and he started that, I think, 
in the late 80s. He didn't start it right from the beginning, but it was very much of a low key affair. So I inherited that and um, we expanded it into um, using you know, a little more of a reception. And, and I did the whole thing. It's one of, the, one of the most gratifying things I did all those years. I think I, I hosted and planned 54 Citizen of the Year events over the years. So it was, it was quite something, but it, it, they always turned into family events. And it was, I thought it was wonderfully done where we asked people in the community for nominations. And I really stress that they write something about the person. They don't just say, I vote for Joe Smith. That doesn't tell us anything. And then I would, I would have judges. I would have four people and I would be the fifth, but I only broke a tie where we would sit and we would go pour over these nominations. And I would have as many as 30 nominations. And some people wrote novels about people. And, but I always tried to pick people in Hingham that, that, were, um, that understood the town and, and kind of knew a little bit about people living here. And even if they didn't know the nominee, they could, they could really reflect. And so it, it was great. And the, the, the celebrations, every single one of them was, was, was wonderful. Can you think of maybe two or three uh, names of citizens of the year that you really enjoyed the, the whole well, process? Well, I enjoyed, I enjoyed them all, but um, I remember um, Bill and Catherine Reardon, they were citizens of the year the same year that William and Kate got married <laughs> in London. So I think we had a great time. And as I recall, I think Martha Reardon brought in some sort of crowns or great things. So we had a lot of fun with that. And then I think the most memorable one in Cohasset was there was this wonderful man, Tommy Wigmore, who was a townie and he was just did a myriad different jobs. And, and one of his, his, um, his big loves was supporting the veterans. His dad was head of the American Legion and Tommy was in the sons of the Legion. He didn't serve himself. But he started that wonderful um, field of honor display, which had turned into a tradition in Cohasset. So with Tommy, what happened was um, it was around Christmas. It was from now probably going back six years. And um, he had some sort of a headache and went to the doctor and got the unbelievably horrible news that he had that kind of brain tumor that Ted Kennedy died of, a glioblastoma, something like that. So the town rallied behind him. And of course he became our, our citizen of the year. And so for that celebration, he was in a wheelchair and he was still, he was still okay. He had been going through all kinds of chemo and treatments, but we had it at Atlantica. And um, I'll never forget, I was standing beside him and I announced, and here's Tom Wigmore, our citizen of the year. And everyone stood up and jumped up and started applauding. And I, I just felt something go inside Tommy. Like there was some sort of a force and he was able to, to really pull himself together and say some wonderful things. And we had music and um, Lily Testito saying, you were the wind beneath our wings. I mean, it was, oh my God, I get crying just thinking about it. And he only lived about six weeks after that, but we were able to share Tommy with the bigger community and, and he was able to, to, to see how much loved he really was. So it was so gratifying. Well, that, that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful evening. Now, at some point, you're no longer with the Hingham Journal. Well, tell Correct. me about was, how that came about. Well, it was very difficult. I was dedicated to being the editor. I mean, what could be more fun than being the editor of a small town paper in a small town, never mind being the editor of two? So it was something I, I just, it, I became synonymous. Um, people would say, I'm going to go see Mary Ford. And Mary Ford became one word. It was never Mary or Ford. It was always Mary Ford. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really hard, but the time had come. Um, you know, the, the clock moves on. Things were changing drastically in the industry. And um, a lot of, there were a lot of staff cuts and more and more was being placed on us. And, and, and sadly, less and less emphasis on the local news that we were used to providing, not just the quick, fast stuff, but in-depth uh, articles, lots of in-depth opinion. So it was just time for me to move on. And so it took a lot of self-reflection, but that's what I did coming up to uh, two and a half years ago now. So what year was it that you retired? I retired in um, the end of September. I think it was September 30th, 2018. Okay. And they and uh, held a little uh, soiree for you. 
Yep, I had a little gathering um, with uh, Mer my, uh, my fellow newspaper people in Marshfield. And then, of course, that spring, I had the great honor of being selected to be the Grand Marshal of what now was the last Hingham Fourth of July parade. And the people behind that parade, let me tell you, they all deserve to be citizens of the year. That is a <laughs> huge undertaking. But to be able to sit in a, I think it was like a Mercedes convertible. I mean, that alone was was a blast. And to and to be in that parade was was just uh, was such an honor and such fun. And I'm I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity and to wave to all of my my wonderful friends. So Mary, what is it that you miss the most about being the editor of the Hingham Journal and the Coasset Mariner? Well, I miss, I'm, I'm a kind of a government groupie. So I, I miss being in touch with all the issues and, um, and talking to people that would come up to the office and, and seeing the passion that people had about whatever it was, whether it was against something or for something and being able to share people's stories with the community. And, and the wonderful thing about, about the days that I was in newspapers and I think it was the best time to be in was when you do that kind of a job, you have something tangible at the end of the week. You hold it in your hand. And there are so many jobs out there where you don't have that that sense of satisfaction, that sort of tactile uh, part. And so I, I miss that. And I'm, you know, I miss all my readers and, and feeling like kind of a big fish in a little pond. It, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was hard work. I won't, you know, there are a lot of long hours. And uh, sometimes we made mistakes and um, we, we always came out the next week if we, if we made kind of a big blooper um, and tried to correct. We didn't make too many um, bad mistakes where they really, in my opinion anyway, were not really correctable, but we made some bad typos over the years. In fact, I think my first or second Hingham Journal, um, the Rotary Club was doing something, a uh, fundraiser for prostate cancer, and we misspelled prostate, prostrate in the headline. <laughs> I heard from every member of the Hingham Rotary. And then we we had the other, my reporter, Alice Coyle, one of my first reporters, did a story on Bear Cove Park and we spelled it B-E-A-R. And we heard from everyone <laughs> in the town of Hingham. You are not Hingham girls. <laughs> <Who knows that? laughs> so Mary, what is it that you miss the least? Well, I probably the long hours and not being able to take much time off. Um, so I, I missed a lot of vacation time. And, and the reason is it was very difficult. I, I have to, I was kind of a perfectionist in a way, not that the papers were perfect, but I had a certain thing that I wanted them to cover and to be and, and not to leave out like my cats. Every week we had a give me shelter and there was a cat in there. And um, because the first call I get were, where's the cat? The cat was missing from the paper. So there were all these little pieces. Think in terms of a big salad and you know somebody likes tomatoes and someone likes, uh, uh, cucumbers and lettuce and carrots and onion and some people don't. So the nice thing about about pulling a paper together is you make sure you have something in there for everybody's taste. So if they don't like the police log, but they like the cats, um, if they don't like something else, they like around town. If they don't like the cartoon, they like Kingdoms Yesterdays. So I was kind of an expert at that. So. When I would come back from vacation and see that someone had messed up my papers, <laughs> very hard to get over that. And then you, I had so much catching up to do. So the hours were probably the, the thing I liked the least, but, um, but everything else I, I really enjoyed. And I feel very fortunate to have had that opportunity to, to have had a wonderful career. I don't know if everybody can actually say that. Well, in the, uh, in the late part of 2018, you stepped down and you went home to Situate to be with Conley and your dog, George. Yeah. <laughs> and um, sounds to me like somebody spent some time making a book. Ooh. I did. Well, one of, my, one of my dreams was to be an author in addition to editor and writer and reporter. And I, um, I've always admired over the years, people would come up with their books that they've written. And I just thought that was wonderful. And we did our best to give them, give them a boost and to get their name out there. And so what my husband Conley has the most remarkable story. And I learned about it when we first met that he was the 15th of 16 children. 
He's from East Tennessee, up in the Smoky Mountains. Big, huge, four family. His parents were born in 1900. Um, you know, they were having most of their kids during the midst of the Depression. There was very deep poverty. And to learn his story about how he, he what they call run off, we call it running away from home at 13 and hitchhiking through the South and ending up in New Orleans selling hot dogs. I always thought this is just an amazing story. So I thought someday I'm gonna to have to get this story down on paper, but with all the hours I was keeping and the enjoyment I was having as in the newspaper business, it just wasn't gonna happen. So when I left the papers, the best metaphor I can describe is it's like falling off a cliff. When you've had that kind of a career, that much demand on you and you wake up and now it's, it's over. It's like, well, okay, I'm feeling kind of lost. So I was able to dive into um, initially transcribing. So what I had Conley do starting maybe 25 years ago, when he would go home to Tennessee once or twice a year, and I didn't always go with him because of my work schedule, I had him bring a tape recorder in the car and just have him talk into it and share all of his memories, the, the wonderful details about his youth and his experience and the quirky things and the people he met along the way. So I dove into transcribing those. And then I also sat down with him using my digital recorder because he had the old little mini, mini tapes um, and interviewed him like I was a, a reporter and had him go through the chronology and, and try to get into more how he felt and what he was thinking. So that's how I started. And then I found on the internet, I wasn't aware of them before and I can't remember who actually put me in touch with, with the idea, but these groups are called meetups. And meetups, you can meet up if you're a, a stamp collector, if you're a cook and you meet up with other people and in your area, this is before we got into COVID when everything went to Zoom. So I started joining these writing meetups and I joined one in Abington, the wonderful young man who's a published author who felt like giving back. And he, and he we would bring in chapters to critique and everyone would, would weigh in and then he'd explain. And then I was in another group in Braintree and, and then I started joining classes at Grub Street in Boston, which is a, a writing center. And I thought initially I was writing a memoir. So I joined a memoir class and, I, and, the, and the instructor would give you some idea and tell you where you were going right and going wrong. And I kept taking more classes at Grub Street. Then I gravi gravitated over to the online version of the classes. But I also hired, you can hire the instructors there to do a critique. And so I did that three times. I sent the whole manuscript, I revised it and I sent it out again to another instructor and they would come back with like a 10 page single space typed. This is what's working. This is a question I have. And so I took it all, I was always a good learner. Like when I walked into that newsroom for the first time, I did not know how to write a news article. So I listened and I learned. And so that's what I did. And so I started just plugging away. And then last fall, I decided I would go ahead with a company called Paper Raven Books that I discovered on, on Facebook, which is a self-publishing company. So my book is self-published, but that, that field has expanded tremendously. And what this company does is they assist you in that process. So you pay up front, you can pay in installments, but they help you um, with the proofreading, with the cover, which we had a cover design contest. I had more than 200 entries for my cover from all over the world. So it was really exciting. And- The um, cover looks extremely professional, like it was done it by a, an agency. Yes, well, it's wonderful. And the book, the inside of the book too, the cream colored pages, the way the inside is designed, it's all part of this process. So it's very professionally done. It's no longer just saying, I'm gonna publish this on, on Amazon and it comes out tomorrow. This is really done with a lot of thought. And they also are terrific at the launch of the book. So they understand the algorithms and the metadata and how to get your book ranked number one in at least three categories, or at least one category. We were ranked number one in three when we first came out in the last week of February. So I've only been out, what, maybe two and a half months or something like that. And so it's been wonderful. I, I don't have any regrets at all. I'm so excited the way the book's been received. And um, I'm just looking forward to the, to the movie, which I'm hoping someone will <laughs> call me up and say, let's sign let's sign the movie rights mary i just want to know are you going to have a cameo in the movie 
Um, oh, that's a good question. I suppose I could, um, I think I'm too old actually. <laughs> I think if there's any man, because Conley's mother would have been in her 40s, or no, she would have been in her mid 50s, I think, when the book takes place. So, um, so I don't know about that, but um, but anyway, it's been it's been wonderful. It's been something I through COVID I could throw myself into, and Conley's been every part of the way. He's been part of this process, and he really is enjoying sharing his story which I think appeals to the general audience, but also people who um, remember the 50s. There's lots of uh, historical, uh, you know, the kind of uh, Andy of Mayberry type uh, situation, especially in East Tennessee and the South, and also young people that may have made some bad decisions, which Conley did as a, as a youngster, and that propelled him to head out on the road. And he, he was able to pull himself out of this hard scrabble background and, and make something really good out of his life. So there's a nice strong message there as well. Well, the book is a, is a very easy read. It only took me about four hours to read it yeah. uh, from top to bottom and I never put it down because it is an interesting story. But the, uh, the, the thing that occurred to me was that you know he had a very uh, disciplinary uh, strict father who, yes. who made, who didn't show much empathy for any of the problems that any of the children in the family might have held. And uh, the, the story is so easy to read that, um, that I think that, that you're to be commended for writing a good story. Oh, and, thank you. you know, so <laughs> your first try is pretty good. Now, how was this book received when it was distributed down in his hometown of Knoxville? Well, they've, they did a nice write up. Um, the Knoxville News Sentinel has kind of a bunch of um, uh, branches, I guess I would say. So they put it in, um, I think the hall, the halls, Fountain City Shopper News, but it was on the front page, big story. I was interviewed by a wonderful reporter on the phone. And, you know, and I was able to connect with, there's a, there's a wonderful man down there um, who has all the alumni from Halls High School. He seems to be sort of the the holder of all of this and he's younger than than we are but he's got all ages so he was able to to share it out to literally thousands of of um halls high alumni who could share the story and, and conley was when he finally got back home and settled in he was incredibly popular i mean they made him rather than shun him for being what he called the jailbird and a runaway they treated him like he was Johnny Cash. I mean, it was like the, the people stood and let him walk through and made him not only class president, but student body president. So he had a, a lot of charm. So he was quite well known um, at the time. But I do think the father, as you, you touched on the father-son relationship, I think it's a key theme in the book. And I think it's universal. I know... Um, one of my sons returned two years ago, he was living in Dubai, and he said in, in that culture, there's often very big, difficult conflicts between fathers and sons, because the fathers tend to, you know, it's their way or the highway, literally. And that's the way Conley's father was. He was born in 1900. He wasn't named until he was four or five. He's the youngest of a big family. And the reason was that he was, at the time, was weak and sickly, and his parents didn't think he'd live. Now, they were from Eastern Kentucky. They'd already lost two children. So he didn't invest a lot in this child because- he, he, Even the name? Even the name. They hadn't bothered. So a preacher stopped by. This is the way the story goes. And said, what's this one called? And they said, well, I hadn't named him yet. And, they, and he named him. <laughs> so- uh, <laughs> So his dad was a, was was a difficult but a complex person, and my hope is, and I found this in some other movies and books I've read that that sometimes there's a tendency to paint someone as a one dimensional character as being only mean or being only a, a jerk or something like that when they're much more complicated than that. And I'm hoping that that comes through. And I think in the end that Conley when he's you know, in the Air Force and his, and his father dies, he's, he realizes that his dad was, was complex and was trying to send a message that you have to survive because survival for them was, was a very difficult journey. Well, that leads me to my next question. Yeah. Did Conley read the book and what's he think? 
he is, he loves it. I mean, he, it's, I, I'm glad I was able to, to write it because it would have been 10 times longer had he been doing the writing and he would have included every little thing. And one thing that I learned through this process is that you have to leave some stuff on the cutting room floor. You, if it doesn't move the story along, it doesn't matter how, how um, cute or interesting the little vignette is, take it out. So I learned that through my meetups and through Grub Street, and I was able to make some of those tough decisions. Well, but that sounds like editing to me. <laughs> he's been thrilled with the response, the reviews. If you get a chance to go on to Amazon and read the reviews, some of them are just amazing. I mean, one person said it was life-changing for someone that maybe had made some bad decisions. And for the most part, it's been highly recommended um, as, as a, it's a coming of age story. And, and so if you enjoy that, that kind of, uh, of uh, book, that it's, it's something I think, and, and like you said, you could pick it up. It's too bad they don't have airport bookstores anymore for the most part. But to me, I think if you spotted it at the bookstore at the airport and you were gonna be on a long flight, you grabbed it, you'd read it on the flight, and then you'd probably not even know how long the flight was. It would just go very quickly for you. So Mary, What's next for Mary Ford? Well, at the moment, I'm sort of diving into the marketing aspect of uh, publishing a book. So locally, I'm doing great. I've had a book signing in Buttonwood, Buttonwood Books and Toys in Cohasset. They've sold a bunch of my books. They have now a display. I just talked to Barnes & Noble. They've sold some and they're getting some more in. But you can go and order from either bookstore. Storybook Cove in Hanover is another one. Um, you can order directly on Amazon. So I'm trying to figure out, and it, it's kind of absorbing me at the moment, so I haven't moved on to my next writing step, to how to sort of break through the local market and get the book to take off beyond Knoxville and my area here where, where so many people know me. So I think it's just a matter of um, figuring that out. I'm taking an Amazon ad course online now for authors, but it's very complicated. There's a lot of little steps. so. I'm doing baby steps, but I'm having fun doing that. And I'm still in a um, couple of writing groups. So I've, I've dug out a novel that I wrote back before I started with the Mariners when I was just a reporter. And um, I put it aside, I found it in the attic. So I'm t I've taken that out and I'm starting to rework it because I'm a much better writer now than I was 30 something years ago. So we'll see where that takes me. But at the moment I have so much satisfaction with my current book that I'm trying to just sort of live in that glow for a while. Well, you know, one of the things about being a senior citizen, having retired from your major career, and is that it looks like you as a senior citizen are trying to establish a new career. It is. In, in and it involves way. learning. Yeah, isn't it funny though, to think of yourself as a senior citizen? I mean, it's like, oh my God, how did that happen? I sort of think, oh no, I'm not a senior citizen. What well, I think you wake up one day and you realize, oh, I've got a number associated with myself now that I never thought I'd get there. Exactly. Or now, or I got, or how did I get there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so where does the time go? It's just absolutely crazy. So it is, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I've. I have a small editing service that I try to help. I've been editing some college essays for a man who has a company in Canton. And I um, do that kind of on the side. I enjoy editing. It's kind of like, I, I was never good at math, but it kind of reminds me of math. You try to figure things out, move things around, make sure the punctuation and the spelling, capitalizations work and things like that. So, so I don't know what the future, but I just have to say, if I can do it, I'm 72 years old, it's no secret. If I can write a novel and have it published at 72 and it's being well received, then you can do it too, people. It's, it's not impossible. If it's a dream, follow it. Well, thank you very much, Mary. It's been a great pleasure to have you here today. And just wait for the next edition of Someone You Should Know. Today was Mary Ford, our Someone You Should Know. Goodbye, everybody. See you next time. Mm -hmm.